Welcome wrestling fans, welcome to Curtain Jerk, and as always, I'm your host, Jacob Grindy, reporting for the Main Event March YouTube channel and Near Falls Media. It has been a big week in pro wrestling. It's been a big week in my consumption of pro wrestling, live pro wrestling. I went to WrestleCade uh, the first two nights. I didn't go Sunday and I didn't go to uh, the Return of the Dragon, uh, Ricky Steamboat's uh, final match on Sunday. I was kind of wrestled out. Uh, I went to the Impact show on Friday. They're like Retro Federation, IPWF, the roster of Impact, portraying uh, retro 80s style, 70s and 80s style, more or less, characters. Uh, it's kind of like when uh, Saturday Night Live does a movie. Uh, something that would be a good five-minute sketch stretched out to about a, you know two or three hours. Uh, it gets kind of old, loses its luster, but it was an okay time. The cool thing about that show was my friend and friend of the show, Kenny, first wrestling show ever, so it was really fun to kind of experience that with him. Uh, went to a cool late-night pizza place after that. That was cool. You could tell it was just full of WrestleCade uh, patrons, WrestleCadians, I guess you would call us. And then we went to the after party at the Marriott Hotel where most of the wrestlers and most of the fans who had to uh, stay overnight uh, stay during WrestleCade. You know, I live like 20 minutes away, so I just go home. But a lot of people, including the, you know, it's still real to me, damn it guy, uh, Sean Ross Sapp, I think I saw down there, uh, Johnny Swinger, tons of uh, luminaries, if you will, uh, who make up WrestleCade. We can all stay at the Marriott. Um, and the after party was a good time. I'm not drinking right now in my life so uh we didn't stay too long there wasn't really anything for us to do uh if you weren't drinking but it was kind of like the bar scene of star wars here i mean uh you know you just could didn't know where to look so many cool and interesting things i mean as we're walking up rich swans outside i walk in look to my right katie forbes is shaking her ass i look to my left and johnny drip drip is taking a sip sip brian pillman jr talking to Ro sean ross sap right in front of us and uh, brian pillman, he was talking very enthusiastically he was talking about something uh it looked like they were both having a good time everyone was having a good time i mean it was wrestlecade weekend uh for the short time spent at the after party it it was a good time i had a good time uh but that Saturday Super Show fucking slapped. Friday was okay. Friday was interesting. Um, but Saturday, I felt like I got my money's worth. Even though I won a contest. Shout out Natalie from Yes Weekly. Uh, she hooked me up with the tickets for winning the contest. I met her in Greensboro and went out to Winston-Salem. Uh, the highlight being an amazing match from Speedball Mike Bailey versus Dax Harwood. Uh, match almost went the distance, but literally the last three seconds, Dax Harwood got the pin. We were all counting down the the end of the match as a as a crowd, and then before you know it, Dax won the match. It was really cool to see. I think I was actually sitting in front or behind Dax's family. There was a you know a nice about eight seats of people. Uh, that kind of, you know, looked like a nice uh, Carolina family. And then when Dax won, they all got up and left. And that's what we kind of figured. This must be, you know, none of them looked like particularly big FTR fans. But they were definitely invested in Dax Harwood. And as soon as that match ended, they got up and left. And it was midway through their show. So I don't think they were just here to see, you know, FTR or Dax Harwood. But as I digress... Um, the that that great match, Dax Harwood versus Speedball Mike Baylor, was not my highlight. My highlight of this whole show was Jeff Jarrett bitch slapping a fan. Yes, you heard it right. Second fan I've seen assaulted in that very wrestling venue, uh, in the Benton Convention Center. And I hope it's not the last. Honestly, I love when wrestlers assault fans. I'll just go out and say it. I love that shit. Uh, Jeff. Uh, was walking to the ring, getting heat uh, f for his upcoming match with Matt Hardy. That was going to happen a few moments 
after this altercation and then this fan stood up and started yelling at him uh and i guess he must have pointed at him or pointed put his finger on him or something happened to where uh the yelling just turned into a bitch slap boom and jeff jared says uh you know he touched me if you touch me if you touch me this will happen he was saying i didn't touch you and the guy was just kind of holding his face like macaulay culkin did on home alone uh didn't you know try to fight uh, Jeff Jarrett, even though he was, you know, he was jacked too. Uh, I, I mean, I, I know Jeff Jarrett had his guitar there. You know, you always got to watch out for that. But I, uh, I was surprised the man didn't try to, uh, you know, escalate the fight even more. Uh, there was security around and everything like that. But yeah, he just got straight up bitch slapped and uh, then sat down in his seat holding his face like Macaulay Culkin. And as we're leaving. This is how I know it wasn't staged, guys. You can I, I know what you're thinking. Obviously, I'm getting worked. I've seen, uh, you know, enhancement talent, uh, makeup uh, for empty seats, and then I've seen them getting, like, taken out when I was watching AW Dynamite or something like that. This was not this situation, I promise you. Because as we're leaving, that fan is leaving with us, and he's still upset. You can just see his face. He's still visibly upset for getting slapped. I mean, I would be too... Uh, and someone says, well, at least you can say you got bitch slapped by Jeff Jarrett at WrestleCade. And the guy turns around to this other fan and says, I don't know if that's a good thing. And it's not. It's not a good thing. Um, but that was definitely the highlight of the Super Show for me, even though there's a lot of good wrestling. Carlito, a staple of WrestleCade, wrestled Fandango. That was a good match. I thought that was kind of cool. The guy who was famous for beating Jericho versus the guy who was famous for beating John Cena having a match at WrestleCade. Uh, the Rock and Roll Express, uh, Kerry Orton, or what's his name? Kerry uh, Morton, sorry. And uh, uh, George South teamed up in an eight-man tag. Uh, there was that Ricky Steamboat last match thing in Raleigh, but I didn't go to it. I wanted to go, but I didn't go because... Uh, I, it was in yeah, it was in Raleigh. I work in Whitsitt, North Carolina, believe it or not. Uh, and it started an hour before I got off, and then that's an hour away from me in Whitsitt, North Carolina. Not Winston, but Whitsitt, a very small town. Uh, so I decided to uh, skip Steamboat's last match because I would have already missed two hours of it, and I was kind of, like I said, wrestled out by Sunday. I did go see... The Menzingers and Touche More, two bands that I have enjoyed for a number of years. Uh, fun uh, opener to the Screaming Females. I've seen them twice this year. They kind of rip. Uh, let me know what music I should be listening to. I do like music as well, not just pro wrestling. Let me know in the comments below what your favorite uh, music to listen to is. And let me know if uh, you like these bands as well. Maybe we can connect on that level as well. We cannot connect on raw being good anymore i think they had their little run there for a few months but i gotta jump the shark i gotta give raw a breather uh and let it rest i broke my rule of only watching the big shows for WWE, and then you enjoy big uh you enjoy WWE a whole lot more i did enjoy the big show from WWE this weekend though survivor series i like seeing ozzy osbourne in the opening uh i expect more classic rock songs to be the theme of WWE uh big shows hunter at the helm is uh you know a big fan of this genre we all know he loves like motorhead and everything like that so uh i expect more of this i also enjoyed the show long storyline between Sami Zayn and jay uso but without further ado let's break down every single match from survivor series worst to first and dead last i would say not even fifth but dead last shotzi versus ronda rousey this match sucked and it was sandwiched in between two good matches or, and sandwich in between a whole good show, just right there in the middle of a show, and it just was dog shit. Shotzi is fun to watch because she's reckless. Rhonda is fun to watch because the crowd hates her and she can play that character well, but Rhonda only works if she can kind of be uh, like work through a good match, I, w I would say. And I don't think someone who, you know, kind of gets over for being reckless can really work someone like Rhonda through a good match. And uh, it didn't. It, it wasn't good, like I said already. Um, I heard a lot of uh, talk about this botched DDT from Shotzi. And uh, I saw it for sure, but then I was like, why did this botched DDT 
get all the uh, hype because almost every match or every move here was sloppy. The whole thing was shitty, and Ronda won. Uh, going on to number four, Finn Balor versus AJ Styles. This match would usually be closer to the top, but the show was fun. Uh, a great triple threat and two uh, spectacle like matches in the war games matches so it sits at number four both of these guys worked real snug you saw bruises all over their bodies during and after the match uh aj worked over finn's leg both factions brawling on the outside balor dodges a 450 hits a drop kick crawls to the top of the rope very slow because of the damage done to the leg at the earlier part of the match. Uh, it took a little too much time here. Missed the coup de gras. Got locked into the calf crusher. Balor breaks free. Phenomenal forearm. One, two, three. AJ Styles gets the victory. Number three out of five. The women's war games match. Becky is the only one who really got a pop coming out of the war games match i mean not even bailey Rhea, kinda i was expecting a little more uh crowd participation it was the first match i thought people were gonna be coming out hot here it wasn't like uh you know they got into counting down for the entrance but then once the entrance came out they were just like kind of over it i guess already moon salt off the top by Io Shirai. Uh, Bliss handcuffed herself to Nikki. Why? Because it's war games. That's why. Leg drop off the top of the cage through a table onto the women's tag team champions. One, two, three. Becky Lynch wins for her team. And number two out of five. Pulling in the silver medal. If they didn't tell such a cool uh, story in the war games match, uh, this would have been my best match on Survivor Series. Uh, this match... Uh, it was awesome. All Bobby in the early going. Theory uses the steps to get advantage. Rollins dives. Hurt lock on Rollins while Theory had the headlock locked on Lashley. Rollins with a frog splash out of nowhere to break up a pin. That was pretty sick. Hurt lock on both opponents at once. That was pretty cool. Super Superplex uh, to Theory. And then he rolls through into a Falcon Arrow attempt. But Bobby spears Rollins. Allowing Theory to fall on Seth. One, two, three. Theory steals one, and he is now again your WWE US champion. Great match. But number one, of course, we've already alluded to it the men's war games match. Sammy saves Jay, earning his trust during the match, which was in question throughout the whole show and has been in question throughout the last few months on WWE. Solo comes out, cleans house. Holland gets speared through a table at one point. Powerbomb by KO. The match beyond heating up here. Sammy stops the ref from counting the pinfall for KO. And these facial reactions were amazing here. Just staring each other down. KO is pissed. Low blow from Sammy. Jey Uso with the frog splash off the top. One, two, three. The blunt light get the victory. The story here and the spectacle of the two ring cage match that is War Games. Narrowly beat the u.s title match the traditional three-way match triple threat match um but man what a pay-per-view i can't really say anything bad about it other than uh shotzi versus ronda wwe did a media scrum a uh you know a post game press conference and roman reigns was supposed to talk on it but apparently he didn't talk on it uh, something about uh he was worried that he had a ruptured eardrum um with the spot with kevin owens uh, but no like cm punk muffin moments from roman reigns i think they're really smart about that and i think if someone's upset at all they're not gonna have them out there uh, i mean as good as the Miz to Daniel Bryan talking smack promo was, I think after that backstage brawl in AEW, they're going to have the other company look silly with their press conferences while they, you know, steal the idea for sure, but, you know, learn from the other company's mistakes. And speaking of that other company, AEW had two great, amazing shows on cable television this week dynamite opened with regal coming out and he said that you know max freeman wasn't going to come out because he didn't have time for chicago and yes max is going to be in a movie which is that's real with zach efron a movie about the wrestling family the von erics in texas in the 80s so that's cool but i do think that it does look bad 
uh, to not have MJF, the new champ, come not come out or not even do anything. Maybe just even show that promo he cut on the press conference off the top of the show or something like that. They did not do a good job booking Hangman Page when he was the champion, and I think it's even more important now to have MJF's title reign be sparkling, you know, hit on every level. And I don't think they hit on the opening dynamite of his title reign. Uh, pretty much, I mean, Kenny Omega w- was super big, a cultural icon because of his work in New Japan. So, you know, you got to kind of put him on that same level. But anyone who's come into to AEW and has become their world champion has had a lot of shine from another company other than Adam Page. Yes, Adam Page did wrestle a little for New Japan, did wrestle a little for ROH, but he wasn't holding the world title in you know, a big promotion prior to AEW. So they needed to show that they could make a star and they almost did it with Hangman Page. Um, w, WWE, of course, you know, makes stars and then you, you know, their contract runs out. And then, you know, of course, AEW would be happy to sign them like, you know, Jericho, Mox, Punk. Uh, but they really need to make a homegrown star. Of course, yes, I know MJF wrestled in MLW and in the Indies up and down uh, the Northeast, but no one really knew who he was outside of the very small wrestling bubble until AEW. So they need to nail this title reign. It's very important to nail this title reign. Um, and I, I'm, I want them to do it. I want to watch, you know, Maxwell Jacob Freeman you know, cross that that plane into just being a star, not just being a wrestling star, like we've seen uh, with lots of people over the years do so. Um, Moxley comes out pissed at Regal, of course, but Danielson holds him up. I wonder if Danielson is going to be the next guy to leave Blackpool Combat Club and uh, kind of join MJF or something like that. Uh, Keith Lee, skeptical swerve. Jungle Boy cuts a good edited promo. Wardlow pissed at Joe. I think that uh, if they use Hobbs and Joe to heat up Wardlow again and then, uh, you know, kind of advance him up the card a little bit, he would be a great opponent for the new champion MJF, uh, given their history and everything. That would be fun to watch. I'm not the first person to say that. I've heard it from another podcast. I listen to a lot of wrestling podcasts, and I know that I didn't, that's not an original idea, but I do not know who said it. I can't give credit to it, but I mean, it. You know, you guys are with me here, right? That's a good storyline. Wardlow coming up and wrestling MJF for the world title. Another good storyline that I like is Jade confronting Bow Wow. I know Bow Wow isn't on the same level as Bad Bunny or even Action Bronson in 2022, but I do think he can bring some eyes to AW. And I was thinking about the age range of people that think that Bow Wow is a big deal probably are of the age where they remember wrestling being a big deal so it's not like bringing in like a super young rapper to aw where you know people who are like 17 18 they're like well why do we give a fuck about wrestling in the first place these um i guess mostly ladies being bow wow you know being bow wow fans are you know in their 30s so they remember the rock being really cool on wwf they remember stone cold they might even remember you know nwo and hulk hogan and things like that so i think that this is uh you know he's not as big of a star as bad bunny by any means um but i think that this is a nice crossover appeal and who knows maybe uh you know since jade kicked out kira hogan from the baddies maybe kira hogan aligns with bow wow here and then we have bow wow managing kira hogan um you know to fight jade and we have bow wow being like uh, maybe kira hogan's like bobby heaton or something like that Thunder Rosa is officially no longer the AEW champion. This is sad. Um, she had so much potential winning the AEW title. She still, you know, could come back. Of course, from what I understand, she is uh, not well liked by other ladies in the locker room. And because of this, uh, I think that she kind of seem, seemed to have lost a lot of confidence in herself. And uh, and I've heard rumors of her. Uh, expressing that she might have been a little bullied by some of this, uh, this you know, uh, dislike that the other ladies had had for her to the point where, you know, she doesn't think it would be fun to work or wrestle some of these ladies at the top of the card anymore. Um, but let's give it up for Jamie Hayter. I mean, the, she's a great wrestler. She's over, and that's why she's champion, much like the acclaimed 
who uh, are out there with Billy Gunn. They get interrupted by Jeff Jarrett and Jay Lethal. Crowd chanted, fuck TNA. But I think this would be a good feud here. You got, you know, a lot of uh, ring generals, a lot of ring veterans, a part of this feud. And you got, a, you know, you got the clear heels in uh, the XTNA faction and the, against, you know, clear baby faces, people that are over uh, in the acclaim. So, I mean, sign me up. I'm excited for this. Uh, but going over to Rampage, Hobbs' video package was good. It felt like a Darby Allen video package, not in the same way and the same, uh, you know, content of the Darby Allen video package. But sometimes I watch Darby Allen video packages and I kind of forget that I'm watching a wrestling show. And I feel like uh, in character building, video packages uh, should kind of make you like forget that you're watching a wrestling show, so to speak. And uh, you can then utilize tools from these video packages that uh, can bring out a lot of depth that you can't bring out like in the theatrical nature of a of a wrestling show like on in ring uh, you can make people feel like they're watching like a documentary or like a music video or like some weird maybe like depending on the character like a sci-fi thing or like a like some kind of a hit TV show and uh, I like I said I'm not you know trying to uh, I'm re- trying to be real careful with my words here but yeah like you can obviously do more in movies than you can like a Broadway play out in front of everybody. So when you're in ring, as awesome as matches are, it is limited to how you can uh, kind of build characters. Even in the last few years, I mean, we have seen, you know, stuff with the elite and the stuff with the bloodline kind of push uh, that forward a little bit. But uh, I do think that with these video packages, it's easier to bring out character depth that you cannot showcase as easily uh, you know, in front of the curtain. So I think this Hobbs thing really did that and added a lot of character depth that we haven't seen from Hobbs. And Hobbs has, you know, seemingly has everything, but we don't really see a lot from him. So it's really cool that they did that with Hobbs. The Jericho promo was funny. Claudio interrupts. Athena challenges Mer- uh, Mercedes Martinez in the uh, Who Does Tony Khan Regret Hiring in 2022 Most Match. I mean, these two ladies... Uh, Lackluster signings in the women's division for sure. Um, they face off at the next ROH pay-per-view. Dax challenging Danielson in the holy shit, this match is going to rule stipulation. But then let's break down every single match from worst to first from uh, AW Dynamite and Rampage this week. All nine matches. Number nine, Hikaru Shida versus Queen Amanita. Hopefully I'm saying that correctly. I'm unfamiliar with her and uh, she got her ass beat here. Penelope Ford and Bunny come out, try to distract Sheeta, but it doesn't work. Uh, big knee strike, one, two, three. Number eight out of nine, Darby Allen versus Anthony Henry. Uh, Darby dies on J.D. Drake. Sting takes out J.D. Drake. J.D. Drake taking a lot of punishment here, and he's just on the outside, just trying to cheer his man on Anthony Henry. Cough and drop after a few vicious strikes from Anthony Henry. One, two, three. Darby Allen gets the victory. Number seven out of nine, Dark Order versus Roosh, Butcher, and Blade. Uh, this was a pretty good storyline here. Um, not a good match because it was a 2 one, 3 attack for most of it because 10 was nowhere to be seen, comes out and turns on the people who built him up, the people that got him to the point where he is today in AEW, the Dark Order, Big Larry to John Silver, and then he puts Reynolds through a table, took the Dark Order mask off, and just drops it down on the on the feet of the, the quivering negative one. He says, you know, this is a little kid thing, this mask here, have it negative one. The negative one just crushed, kneeled down at the feet as the heels stand triumphant over top of a weeping child. Uh, this was a very sad moment in AEW history, but it tugged at the heartstrings a little bit. I mean, now that I'm reading this 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 storyline out to me, I'm thinking it should go higher up in the card or higher up in this ranking order I have, but I'm having it sit right here at number seven, and we're moving on to number six which is Hager versus Cassidy. This wasn't the best match, but it was fun. That's probably why I ranked it higher than uh, the sad match. 
Um, so yeah, that's why it's kind of sitting at number six and not number like eight or seven or something. Cassidy dives, he gets caught. Hager gets his hat on. Stun dog, millionaire, one, two. Hager kicks out, roll up, one, two, three. Cassidy retains the Transatlantic Championship. Lights go out. Julia Hart pops out of nowhere on the top of the ramp. Lights come on. Our lights go out again, I guess I should say. House of motherfucking black back in the ring and they clean house. Let's go. This was cool. Um, I love this trios team. After this best of seven series or whatever happens with uh, the elite and um, uh, death triangle, I think it's a no-brainer to have uh, House of Black go after the elite for this six-man championship. Um, if you know, if they win it, I guess. I guess they're down two nothing in this feud here. But who's getting who? I think we're going to best of seven. Uh, Britt and Hater versus Sky Blue and Willow versus uh, Ty Conti and Anna J. Uh, Hater hits the jackhammer, and no one calls it the jackhammer. I mean, Goldberg literally uh, didn't give too much to the wrestling industry, but he gave us a sick move and a sick name, the jackhammer. Give him the credit that he is due and call the move by its name, people. Willow and Sky are both over uh, beyond their push. It's cool to see them in the mix a little bit here, holding their own. But Baker wins with a foot stomp, one, two, three. And then we're going on to uh, number four out of nine out of this week in AEW, the Elite versus Death Triangle. Uh, the Elite come out, and there are CM Punk chants in Chicago. Who would have thunk it? Pac looking like an all-elite Horace Grant with the face mask and the broken nose. Uh, looks really cool. Fuck the elite chance coming out. Omega biting uh, Death Triangle's arm here. One of Death Triangle's arm. Uh, making fun of Ace Steel. Legit biting him in that backstage altercation. Uh, Phoenix hits a cool corkscrew dive. Matt intentionally like fucked up a buckshot lariat looking move to make fun of Punk. So if... Uh, you know, if Punk was pissed about them being childish and then they do stuff like this, um, I kind of see where he's coming from here. Uh, but, you know, the Elite did kind of make a name for themselves, like kind of mocking the NWO and Bullet Club getting over doing that. And then they kind of uh, made a name for themselves even more so by like kind of being disrespectful to the WWE by hijacking their show in the parking lot and things like that. So, I mean, you kind of have to dance with... Uh, the woman you brought and gave you the platform that you're, you know, using to create now. So I see where they're coming from. But I also, through watching all of this, kind of see what CM Punk was talking about. Um, I asked, you know, a lifelong fan of wrestling about this, my father. And he's just like, fuck them both. He does not care about this. And just hearing more and more about it, he just rolls his eyes. I ask him, who whose side is he on? And he always says, Colt Cabana, which I think that's kind of where people are going to end up with all of this. I think uh, uh, the more that you kind of uh, allude to it or tease it without just flat out ignoring it, like Tony Khan probably wants you to do, the more... Uh, that it's going to kind of interrupt um, matches like this. Uh, Matt teases the use of a hammer, and I thought that was really shitty. I know that, you know, you think you're going to, uh, you know, you're like, well, if they're going to boo me, I'm going to give them something to boo. I'm going to be the heel. I'm going to use the hammer. But it really did take away from the heat that Phoenix got using the hammer at full gear. And um, now you don't know who to cheer for because both sides are kind of shades of gray. Um, so it kind of, you know, it, them trying to play into getting booed and ignoring the audience at home that probably wasn't booing them or ignoring the, this for their storyline and taking away from what you were setting up at full gear kind of didn't help. Uh, and you know, this was kind of a mess here. Great wrestling in the ring. That's why it is like in the middle of this ranking system I have, but I mean, I think if I was them, I would just drop all this shit. Um, if CM Punk wants to sue, he would probably, you know, use this kind of thing to uh, show, you know, show his case, which you definitely don't want that if you're the EVPs. And also, um, this little hammer thing that you try to do where now every both sides are shades of gray and we're watching two uh, shades of gray teams uh, do a best of seven series. 
when it's really better to have like a you know a clear face clear heel in all of this which i think they set up nicely at full gear with phoenix using the hammer to get the victory uh it kind of just waters down what you're doing and it kind of makes the backstage stuff way more interesting and a better story than in front of the curtain stuff in the ring stuff and you know wcw lasted about 10 years i mean from when they went to mid-atlantic switched over ted turner it was like 1989 you know 10 to 12 years but people have been making money off of talking about the backstage stuff that happened in wcw for over 20 years so if i was tony khan i would tell them to drop this shit immediately because it's not you know it's not going to look good for you. You might your company might only last like five years, which is as long as uh, TNT has you signed for, and then people are going to still make money. You know, all the wrestlers who have been watching all this shit go down to the back are going to make money on podcasts, make money on books, make money on shoot interviews while you're sitting there with a failed company, just like WCW had. Um, I hope I'm making a lot of sense here. I kind of ranted on and on. I hope I'm making a good point. If I'm making a good point to you, let me know in the comments. And if I'm not making a good point, uh, I guess let me know in the comments as well. But I got to move on to the top three matches from AEW television this week. Number three, FTR versus Top Flight. Backdrop, leapfrog, then a trip into a DDT. Top Flight killing it here. I love that little combination moves they did. A little slip from Dante going uh, from the top rope to the floor but it still looks sick slingshot powerbomb crossbody by cash one two no but then they hit the big rig one two three ftr get the victory sick little match here that honestly made sense here so it beat that six man with the elite and death triangle uh but number two ethan page versus ricky starks this match was great too stokely cutting that good promo coming down the ramp great to see i love promos coming down the ramp I mean, you go back to Road Dog. You go back to what made Enzo Amore popular. I mean, even like more recent history, current day, uh, I know it's rapping, but that's what uh, Max Caster did to get over. This, of course, wasn't in that same vein as those guys that I mentioned earlier, but it was great. Stokely Hathaway, great talker. Ricky taped up, feeling the effects from his past tournament matches. Uh, Stokely then saves Paige from the die, pushing his man out the way. Ref kicks him out. Superplex from Ricky. Spear not once, not twice, but three times. A third time, one, two, three. Ricky Starks gets the victory. I think I must just be, you know, biased here, guys. I love FTR. I love Ricky Starks. So that's why, you know, I think that's why I rank them high. But, I mean, this is my ranking system, guys. This is the official ranking system of the Curtain Jerkin podcast. And you guys know who's booking this shit. Jericho versus Ishii is number one. This match was awesome. Two of my favorites here. And like I was kind of already saying, that's probably why it's number one. Forearm battle. Jericho's chest turns beet red. We've seen that before. But then it starts to bleed here, which was crazy. DDT. From the apron to Ishii, Lion Saw, 1-2, Ishii kicks out, Ishii just won't stay down, he hits a sliding lariat, 1-2, Jericho kicks out, Code Breaker from Jericho, Walls of Jericho, and then he wrenches back and makes it a Lion Tamer, Ishii flips him off before he taps out, what a great moment, man, what a simple and great just great storytelling here. Also, I didn't see anyone talk about uh, Ishii's size here, which I was worried they were going to do, I guess I'm doing it now, but it just... I mean, after that Jonathan Gresham thing, Jonathan Gresham is such a great wrestler, and he like worked his whole life to be the Ring of Honor champion, finally was the Ring of Honor champion, and then he gets a, a match with one of the best wrestlers in the world, Claudio Castagnoli, and everyone just keeps talking about how short he is, so I was worried that that was going to happen here with Ishii uh, wrestling Jericho, because he is a smaller nature, but, uh, you know, big heart is kind of his character very tough and just a great wrestler um but it didn't happen so it kind of as good of a match as was i'm kind of thinking like why the fuck did people treat jonathan gresham that way uh i want to see him back i want to see him in a prominent role in a wrestling company in 2023 uh and i want to see you guys talk to me on twitter at jg pro wrestling or hit me up on instagram where uh i post a lot of stuff that doesn't have to do with running but, or n wrestling uh and 
I also post a lot of stuff that has to do with wrestling, so hit me up on there at running down a underscore DRM. Thanks a lot, guys. Fly high. I'm out.